Hey everybody, one of the GMG reviews. Today we're taking a look at Majestic 13, one more than Majestic 12. Um, a new indie war game from Snarling Badger Studio, which of course is Vince Ventrella and Adam Loper's uh, little indie design project. Uh, this is their third game. Uh, I think they did Rain and Hell as their first one, which was a demonic sort of uh, skirmish game or like arena battler game. Uh, followed by, if you watch my uh, playthrough, Space Station Zero, which was a solo adventure game uh, in a choose-your-adventure style format with like shifting rooms and exploration. Now, Majestic 13 um, is a solo game as well, but can also be played cooperatively. Um, and the general overall theme, if you didn't guess from the title, and you don't know about 90s conspiracy theories, uh, is about secret groups and organizations fighting an alien menace um, that is infiltrating and looking to take over the world called Force. Uh, Force is bad. They send all kinds of like little Goombas and creatures down to try and take over the planet. And of course, Majestic 13, a coalition of different secret organizations and governments, um, stands ready to oppose them. So, if this sounds familiar, it's cool uh, that it's basically taking themes from things like the Bureau or XCOM um, or uh, what was that most recent one? There's another one that was like interdimensional beings for the PlayStation. Shoot. Uh, contact, contract, the con, something like that. You, you ba basically, it's a, it's a, it's the X Files. <laughs> you're, you're, you're fighting against alien conspiracies and shadow governments and all kinds of stuff. We're trying to support them uh, with your own group, and there are 13 groups to choose from, 13 different factions to choose from. So let's jump in. We're gonna go over the basics. I'm not gonna spoil too much about the mission structure and stuff like that, um, because that's the story a little bit of like playing the campaign uh, and the beast cherry. Uh, is generally sort of like open to your own personal interpretation, what you want to make. They don't they don't like tie you to a certain miniature range and stuff like that. Um, but we'll we'll go over like the core mechanics so you can get an idea of what it would be like to play Majestic 13. Now this is a print copy from Drive Through RPG. You can also get it digitally. I'll link it all below. Um, but either way, you can order it from the same website as all their stuff seems to be self-published through there. So. Adam Loper and Vince Ventrell present Snarling Badger Studios Majestic 13. Um, I do really like the layout on this one. So what um, the previous one obviously was uh, wonderfully illustrated. This one is Adam taking like stock photography and, and, and stuff and making this look like it's a dossier. So there's a theme to each of these books. I really like this one in particular uh, because it's using, it, it feels like it's supposed to be like a... 90s to early 2000s like dossier of fax information so it's got little little details like he's put on um coffee rings and stuff like that there's tons of pictures of like you know stock footage of like soldiers or whatever and then the the all the layout and stuff is using like this like sort of type font it almost is like a, a um a teletype or maybe like an old computer screen uh, and then things like throwing in handwritten notes and stuff and posts and things like that so um, let's jump through and look at the core principles. So you have uh, a very small sort of like requirement for scenery and stuff like that. And the idea is you can theme it to your Majestic 13 experience. So whether you set it in like the Catskill Mountains or the Arizona Desert, it's up to you. Um, but you're gonna need a three by three play area, um, five miniatures for your team that represent your team, a dozen or so alien miniatures. These can be of varying sizes and represent the enemies your team will confront. For more information, you can see page 110, which is the Beast Jerry. Uh, 10 and 12 pieces of like varying terrain, like wilderness or urban. Um, a tape measure for measuring devices, some 20 side dice, some D6s, and then a team roster, which is available from their website. So not a lot. Uh, no fancy dice this time around, except for D20s, which are pretty common. You only really need one or two. Um, and as far as the, uh, the D6s go, like a, a handful as well. You don't need a pile of dice this time around. All right, glossary of terms, your acuity. It's your basically like your, um, your awareness stat. Your activation, each team member can activate once and only once. Every alien will also activate at least once, but no more than three times. And during an activation, a model can move, attack, or take other actions, as well as attempt to clear a condition if they're currently affected by one or more. Uh, advantage, this represents your team's training and equipment. So every team can select an advantage. It's like, do you guys have planes? Or are you genetically engineered? Do you have access to advanced equipment? During team creation, you'll pick what your advantage is. Uh, attack, an attack is when you attack someone. You're gonna roll a d20 and add your relevant combat stat usually and look for the defense score. So it's an equaler beat. It's a very linear, almost D&D-esque uh, core mechanic this time around. Um, and I do like that Vince hasn't, hasn't stuck to the same mechanic for each game. 
Um, the evens odds mechanic on piles of D20s was interesting for um, Space Station Zero. And in this one, it's a straight up D&D &D target number. It's like you've, you've got your to hit number and you've got to add your stat basically to a D20 roll and see if you hit it. So defense stats look really high until you realize that like your combat stat could be anywhere between like 10 and 17 that you're adding to the roll. Um, your base, uh, so this is the physical location the team operates from. Uh, much like a video game like XCOM, you've got a base, you can have upgrades, rooms you can add to it, um, and the nature of the base will dictate a certain different advantages you get as well. A campaign, the series of linked games, your combat stat, which is your stat for fighting things. Uh, condition, alien creatures will often give you like debilitating conditions like blind or restrained, stunned or poisoned. A co-op game is a game with two or more players. When you're playing in co-op games, each player will pilot their own team and you will fight more enemies. Uh, critical failure, a one is always a critical failure and some conditions can increase that range. So like if you're like blinded, it could go to like one or two. And a 20 is a critical success. Uh, your defense stat is the number that you need to hit. Your dexterity stat is how fast you can move to avoid danger and clear certain conditions. Uh, dice, etc. 20 sided. Uh, enemies, which are the bad guys, or, or if you're playing a skirmish game, it could be the opposing team. Your equipment, uh, your faction, from which of the majestic 13 factions you're playing, force the bad guys that uh, send the aliens, don't actually know its name. Uh, fortitude is your toughness, that's the fourth stat. Fubar. Uh, fouled up beyond all recognition. I don't think that's what it actually means. Uh, this is an unexpected event that will sometimes occur during a mission. So the surprise sort of like crackerjack events that take place during the mission are called foobars. Uh, your geography is either wilderness or urban, and they can each have separate conditions. Hidden when a model is hiding, your hit points, how much damage you can take. In extremis, when an alien falls below a certain number of uh, hit points, it goes into extremis and becomes more dangerous. Uh, when in this state, the alien will suffer 2d6 damage at the start of their activation, but will take an additional action, right? So they, they, they start bleeding out, but they get more dangerous. Uh, your missions, how far you can move with your movement and your objective, which is what you're trying to do during the game. Out of action, when you go to zero hit points. Uh, psionics is a stat that starts at zero, unless you get the psychic trait, in which case you can become a psychic. Uh, Retech, which is reverse engineered tech from the aliens. Uh, your stats, which is your core stat block, which is the four core stats, and then psychic if you have that one, plus your hit points. Uh, your team, your team members, terrain, which is the physical elements on the table, and a turn, uh, which will always go five turns, and during each turn, all player models will activate once, and aliens, would act, aliens will activate at least once, unlikely multiple times, but no more than three times in any single turn. The idea there is that you activate all the aliens, and this is like a, just to explain that mechanically, the aliens need to activate at least as many times as the team members do, otherwise if there's like one big alien and the five team members are fighting it, their activation advantage gets out of control. So Vince is allowed for like multiple activations for the bad guys potentially, um, in order to make it so that they can respond to you as the player. So the AI isn't super dumb, um, and it doesn't mean that the number of models that the team has is a huge advantage over smaller groups of aliens. All right, teams, like I said, stats, hooray. Uh, when you build a, a, a team, the first thing you're gonna do is find what everyone's stats are. So you pick your model, one's your leader, and then you're gonna roll some dice and add to your stats. So um, stats are fundamentally organized like I described earlier, so you don't need to spend too much time on this se section. But if you're good, um, really good at doing something, then you get certain bonuses based on what your stat is. So the higher your stat is, the better. If your cutie's 14 or more, the team member no longer suffers critical hits from surprise attack, because you just, you're, you can't be surprised anymore. Um, if it's 20 plus, uh, when they attack, if they act before all other enemies, any attacks they make count as surprise attacks. So basically you're that sneaky. And if it's 25 plus, um, each time a team member, um, attacks, sorry, uh, makes a, uh, the team member makes a single roll to spot a hidden enemy once during each of his activations without making an attack or using an action. So you get a free action basically to spot people. Um, you don't usually start with any of these advantages, but you could grow during the campaign to have a stat that that's high. Your, your starting stat block isn't going to be that high. I like this. Um, it's basically D&D feats, right, that you gain during levels. So it, 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 it's an interesting way of adding skills to the game based on how your character develops over the course of the game. And they're all different for each of the stats, like your psionics get different ones, fortitude and dexterity as well. Um, and your defense score, this is the target number that must be achieved to hit you. Unlike other stats, this is a set value and is only modified by equipment. So your, your defense is gonna be the same pretty much no matter what. Uh, stat checks, to make a stat check, you roll d d20 and add the relevant stat. So for instance, making a combat check, you're shooting, you're gonna add your combat stack. Um, and there's gonna be a required roll. So defense, if it's a combat check, it could be like a target number if it's something difficult to do. And the mission will usually set the target number for what you're trying to do. 
Uh, and then he actually calls out, wait, now it's D20s? I thought you only used D12s. I like that I made a comment before, but he actually calls it out in the rules. He's like, oh, I changed I changed what I was doing here because I'm allowed to because I'm a game designer. Good for you, Vince. You're not, you're not, you're not answerable to anybody. <laughs> Uh, and then your missions, which would be laid out with like what kind of geography should you have, what kind of train pieces should be there, and then mix in the rest of your own, uh, who, what enemies there. The bureaucracy. Now, this is a nice actual like little add-on that I like. One of the things that makes a game feel like a game is when rules reflect setting or they reflect theme. Um, and because Majestic 13 is a number of organizations that are all self-interested fighting an alien invasion, they're going to be, there's going to be red tape, right? They have to talk to each other to get along or share resources or whatever. So having bureaucracy be an actual in-game effect of like what bureaucratic hurdles are you overcoming in the mission? It, you could just as easily call it mission special rules, right? And, and have it be different every single time. But the fact that there's actually like a bureaucracy rule and certain missions and, and factions will also interact with the bureaucracy to like overcome it automatically. Like some of them just ignore it. They just cut through the red tape and be like, nope, that's mine. Get that on the plane. We're going. Don't ask anybody. I don't care who you're asking. Like that added layer is a cool mechanic. I just like that. Um, and then your foobar being the thing that can go wrong, your special events, and then aid. Uh, there might be things that you can call for, like airstrikes or things off table. Elements of a turn. All right, so uh, how does the gameplay structure during the course of a turn? Remember, you're going to have five of these typically to go through. Um, so it's capped at five turns, after which basically the saucers arrive or the napalm drops or whatever thing's going to happen is going to end the mission. Uh, during each plane, the players will activate each of the team members once. Uh, and they activate them in order of their acuity score from highest to lowest. So your stats do matter here. You have a, a, it's basically, it's not roll for initiative, it's fixed initiative. And the same goes for the bad guy. So if you look at a bad guy here, like hit points, this is a big guy, uh, Benzith the Nightbringer. Uh, it's a huge bad guy. So it's got 130 hit points. It's in extremis, is at 40. It's defense is 23 to hit. It's a cutie's 29. So it's probably going before everybody else. It's combat's 25, dexterity's 27, fortitude's 21, and it's psi value is 25. So lots of high numbers here. Um, and then, yeah, and then you get to make your actions. And then when once you activate, the aliens get to activate. So during each turn, uh, they'll activate each team once. Activated by the, based on their acuity stat from highest to lowest. Um, in a co-op game, the same rules apply, acting between the players based on those same stats. And enemies also activate based on their acuity, just like uh, the player's team members. If multiple act uh, enemies share the same acuity, randomly determine which enemy activates first. Enemies also activate additional times during the turn based on their type. So they, they could basically go um, additional times if they're like faster aliens, and that's gonna allow them to, again, offset the fact they might be outnumbered. If a team member uh, and an enemy share an acuity, uh, the players can choose to activate their own team member uh, or the enemy as they seem fit. And when a team member is, or enemy is activated, they may do the following. Enemies will act according to their prescribed AI, which is described later on. So they can clear a condition. At the start of an activation, they may attempt to clear one and only one condition. Um, at the target number of 20, if it's phase one, or 25, if it's phase two. Basically, the campaign is set in phases, at which point they become easier and harder. Um, this does not require an action. It may simply be the model shaking off an effect. If it's failed, the model may continue their activation, but must do so uh, with that condition and any other still in effect. A uh, model may move up to its dexterity stat in uh, inches each turn. A model may move uh, before or after their action, but they may not move that um, and split it up. So you can move quite far in this game. Uh, action, each model may take one or more actions, unless uh, specified otherwise, such as when they're an extremist. An action may uh, be any of the ones below. So attack, move, help, team members, protect team members, or call for aid team members to use an aid action. Um, so basically, it's move act. You have two actions, one of them's always move. Uh, movement's pretty standard. Combat is, again, I said, you're rolling and adding your, so your d20 plus your stat, and you're trying to hit a target number. Uh, you can teleport sometimes, I like that. Uh, if it, there's a, there's a general rule to moving here. If it sits, it fits. <laughs> it's really easy. Can I place the model here? If you can put the model there, then it can stay there. Otherwise, it's not allowed to stay there. Uh, combat stats. All right, so attacker, if you're within range of your weapon, um, then they also have to be in line of sight. If it's a ranged weapon, roll d20, add your combat stat. If the d20 plus the combat stat equals their defense, uh, then the attack is successful. And then attacker rolls for damage for the weapon that's successfully attacked. Every weapon might have a different damage stat for how much damage you do. Um, a 1 is always a miss. If you get a 20, um, then you get additional damage. A critical hit's always a hit regardless of the combat stat. A check is compared to the defense. In addition, it's a double damage attack. 
Uh, surprise will make criticals on a 19 or 20, and of course, if you are um, suffering the effect of a condition, then uh, your critical failure becomes a one or a two. Uh, so stunned, fortitude, when a model stunned, their combat and dexterity scores are halved. Poison, when a model is poisoned, uh, the distance they can move is halved. They must roll twice when making fortitude checks and discard the highest. Uh, restrained, dexterity, their move is treated as zero and they automatically fail dexterity checks and then blinded. The model does not have line of sight to any other models and automatically fails an acuity check to spot hidden enemies. It's like when Mulder shoots the, 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 the super soldier alien clone troopers. Um, and all of a sudden uh, can't see anything. You can also sometimes heal through certain effects. Cover can of course um, account for like uh, different bonuses and penalties. Uh, and that's really it. So the core mechanics are only the first 30 pages, including some preamble and also like what the core of the game is. And then we're gonna create your team. So first things first, I like that. Nice, simple, streamlined core mechanics over and actually making a team. Uh, so you get five team members. You can choose who's the commander. Everybody gets their stats. Uh, when you do your stats, basically, you're gonna roll 2d6 and add the stat bonus. So everybody starts with five on everything and you add 2d6. So like, I'd be acuity 11, combat 10, dexterity eight, and fortitude 14 there. So big bruiser who's not very dexterous, but gets lots of like, fight. Um, and then if I was attacking and I was combat 10, I could roll and that'd be a 25 for whatever I'm trying to shoot at. Uh, and then you don't roll for psionics unless you get the psionic bonus, in which case the stat becomes five. And then you choose your faction. The factions are very funny. Some of them are like serious, some of them are not. Like, oh dear, the, uh, apart the Office of the Department of Extraterrestrial Alien Research. It's like the Department of the Interior's Alien Hunters. PsyOps, who are the, um, the former like MK Ultra uh, acid testers who turn into like psychics. Uh, Agricultural League, so you know, the farmers band together over the crop circles. Industrial Arms, which is the military industrial complex, the Sanctum, uh, where like the uh, the various like religions of Earth take, uh, take take basically action against the aliens. The Silicon Syndicate, so the Silicon Valley pros get together to fight the aliens. The Naturalized, these are the greys who come to live on Earth because their planet was also destroyed by force and become basically like friendly to the humans. The Women's Defense Force, uh, when Majestic 13 was formed, women were not formally allowed to enter the military. So basically these became their own like secret society. The Roughnecks, who were like miners, drillers, and sailors that encountered the aliens and formed like a league to fight them. Section 6, which is kind of like the old OSS. Uh, the Hippocratic Mercy, which are doctors who've discovered them. Uh, the 1%, the ultra wealthy. The Dispersed, who are sort of like covert academics, hackers, and like, you know, white hat hackers. The, basically imagine like um, the dark web went to war against the aliens. Uh, and you pick one of these factions, they can each have like a bonus, they can each have like a feature, like for instance, if you check out the Sanctum, they get a new different type of base that nobody else can have. Um, the industrial complex's guns are better than everybody else's. The naturalized have like psionic uh, weaknesses, but they get to, to have like little gray aliens basically on their teams, potentially, or like their help. Uh, and then, you know, healing from the Hippocratic Mercy. And then you pick an advantage. So everybody's got like something that makes their team special and different, and that's your advantage. Could be like advanced combat training. They could have super power armor. They could all be on drugs. <laughs> a tactical command team. They could just be tougher than everybody else. Uh, well armed. All of these things basically allow you to, to, to like sort of tighten up your group. And then certain factions can have psychics. You get psychic powers. Uh, and everybody gets to pick three pieces of equipment to start, and everybody gets one weapon. If When you build your warband, you only get a phase one weapon because you're not in the phase two of the campaign. Later on, you can get phase two weapons because you basically steal them or research them from various groups, or you just become more important, so Majestic 13 gives them to you. Um, and the, the, the idea here is that you start off, and both gear, equipment, uh, and your stats are your like your your sort of path to leveling up. The better your stats gets, you unlock those special skills. The better your gear gets, uh, once you get to phase two, you can have better guns and equipment. And there's lots of them for like medical stuff, armor, detection. And then finally, you start to find out what your base is. So where are you operating out of? Is it a basement in the FBI? Uh, is it a remote intelligence base? Is it an urban infiltration base, a medical research base, a military command base? And each of those types of bases will have different upgrade slots, so how many times you can add an upgrade to it. Like, it's basically rooms. Um, and then also, like, whatever their benefits are on top of that. So you have all kinds of base expansions. And, and the bulk of the game is basically given to this, this stuff, right? Like, what can you add or have or grow your, your team with.
Uh, rules for co-op games, so like playing with more than one player. Skirmish games, you play head-to-head -head with a player. If Majestic 13 has some infighting. And then the enemy AI and how they activate. Uh, different types of monsters will be tagged, right? So most enemies um, will activate normally, but monstrosities and ravagers will have special activations and so will stalkers. So think of this as like, the, these are the, not necessarily the boss aliens, but these are the bigger different aliens might have one of these tags. They'll give them different activations over the time, uh, the course of the game. Uh, and then there's your mission. So like, is it wilderness or urban? Your train set up. Tables for like randomly generating all that stuff. Is there any dangerous train the table? Uh, and then randomly generating air enemies if you want. So you can generate an enemy randomly. Uh, your bureaucracy for the game. So like, if you roll a 2d20 and roll a 2, the mission's a trap. Generate two additional alien creatures from the enemy table and they've, they've trapped you. Uh, like your location information can be incorrect. Like all these things can basically be the, the, the like, you, you know in any movie where they show up and they're like, they didn't tell us it would be like this. It's basically when the team, like the commando team shows up in Predator and they think they're having a rescue mission, but actually they're, they're like study an alien and figure out what the hell is going on. They're working for the CIA and they thought they were there to rescue guys. Uh, secondary objectives, and then it's set up. And then we get a whole slew of missions that are thematically sort of like around playing the campaign and what monsters you'd use. So you can generate one randomly and you can also play these. And then it's the campaign system and the bestiary, which I don't want to spoil too much of because I'm going to do a series on this obviously at some point. And uh, that's it. So. Majestic 13. I, I'm excited about this. This isn't an often explored theme. There was a, uh, a game, a board game, a board game, miniature game hybrid called something seven, section seven, or like level level seven by Privateer Press that was kind of like this. Obviously there's like the XCOM kind of theme uh, or the Bureau sort of theme. Um, I, I love this. I'm a huge X-Files fan. I actually don't have to paint my team at all. My miniature's already ready. I played Perilous Tales basically like this. Perilous Tales was um, one of uh, Mike Hutchinson from Gaslands' uh, games that was in the very same theme of this, but it was more like, it was more Monster of the Week, right? You'd investigate like a supernatural or like, um, uh, uh, you know, alien or some kind of like outside there, out there sort of like enemy. Every every time you went to play, this one's purely supposed to be like about an alien invasion. Uh, but I got my Skelder and Molly ready to ready to go and ready to go and investigate stuff. So it's gonna paint some aliens, uh, and I'll be ready to rock and roll. I got all the terrain and everything already too. So expect to see this one pretty soon on the paint table or uh, on the um, actual game table for a let's play. So I, I think it's cool. I like that the core mechanics are simple. Like the team building is fairly open. I love. Uh, it, the writing is good in this. The fact that it's a, a, a commonly like sort of like held theme of like alien invasion and secret organizations and societies, but he's put his own spin on it. Naming all 13 of the different like factions I think is really cool. There's some tongue in cheek stuff that's, that's very clever in there. And overall the gameplay looks simple enough to be easy to pick up and play, but engaging enough through like the character creation. I think there'll be like a good emerging narrative. Um, and the monsters look fun to design yourself because it's all miniature agnostic, right? So you can use whatever you like. So we'll probably put this one on the table, hopefully in August. You'll be able to see it get played. Uh, thanks to Vince and Adam for sending me a copy. And for you guys for watching, thanks Alan Nash. Up later. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games already recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already and have a look to the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week, and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model cost, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Death Ray Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements like Last Days, Gamma Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.